Hello, welcome to Shaka Extra Time. I am Paul Ndiho. Joining me from his home in Arlington, Virginia is Shaka Sal himself, aka the Kabale Kid. Hello, Shaka. Hello, Ndugu Paul. How are you? I remain simple, easy, and as some of my fans have suggested, an awesome son of Mother Africa. Speaking of an awesome son of Mother Africa, why don't we talk about uh, our mother land, Uganda? Let's uh, talk about uh, the elections. Uh, uh, President uh, Yoweri Museveni, uh, Kaguta Kibuhaburwa, was uh, declared uh, the president over the weekend, having won his sixth uh, term. Uh, let's start there. I was reading a piece by... Uh... A Ugandan a prominent uh, weekly columnist in the in the Daily Monitor, a major Ugandan independent newspaper, and his name is uh, Doctor Munini Murera. He has this weekly piece, uh, which he says uh, is a letter to a Kampala friend. Tinga Siga Tasigan told me. And in his last piece, he says basically that uh, what you just called an election may in fact be a selection. And he argues that uh, part of the reason, frankly, is that uh, you're looking at uh, a political playing field that has never been leveled since 19. 96, that the entire political environment in the Republic of Uganda, when it comes to what you call an election, and Munini Murera characterizes as a selection, has actually been rigged in favor of one player, and that is the incumbent president, General Yoweri Museveni, and that this man, by the way, in his own words, not Dr. Munini Murera's or Shakasari's words, he actually publicly promised Ugandans when he seized the power back in 1986 that nobody would remove him from power with a piece of paper. I don't know what he really meant by a piece of paper, but it seems to me that uh, he actually was referring to a ballot paper. To be honest with you, even a blind person can see quite clearly that what, is, that what has been happening in that country of ours is far, far from being competitive politics. It is true that every, every five years, you are the one who sometimes say that uh, there are periodic elections in Africa. But we are not interested in periodic elections, Dugu. We are interested in qualitative elections. We are interested in an election where the people hold sway. The people are the sovereign. The people are the primary stakeholders. There are some observers who have been saying that what we have actually been seeing in Uganda, far from being competitive democratic election, we basically every five years have people who run, but in fact do not compete because they do not have an opportunity to actually compete fairly. Why? Because imagine, uh, imagine that you are looking at boxers. You're looking at two boxers in a boxing ring. One of the boxers who happens to be an incumbent has his hands free, his legs free, and his opponent, the political opponent, has his hands tied behind his back and has his legs tied together. And when the incumbent boxes, jabs, in fact, at his opponent. His opponent does not have the ability to counterpunch. 
But he keeps saying, punch, punch. But he can't punch. And so that is the sort of circumstances we are talking about, really. But uh, Shaka, uh, just to push back uh, on some of the points uh, that uh, you've made, uh, in fairness uh, to uh, President Ayori Museveni Tibuhaburwa, uh, there are a lot of people who say that uh, when you go up country, uh, he won fair and square. Uh, yes, uh, he had difficulties uh, in the central region where he did not win. Robert Chagulani, commonly known as Bobby Wine, literally swept the, uh, the central region. And to his credit, uh, if you're saying these were selections, there's absolutely no way this young man with a new party could have won so many seats in parliament. To be honest with you, I'm even surprised that very serious political individuals still try to run in those type of selections or elections every five years. In fact, to be honest with you, I don't think they have a point having run in those elections that from the outset they have considered to be unfair they have considered to be not free, not transparent, not verifiable, and not credible. But they still go ahead and run in those elections. And once the results they get, they don't like, because those results do not necessarily favor them. And to begin with, they were never going to favor them under the circumstances anyway. So I find it difficult that at the end of the day, they actually have the audacity to say these elections were rigged. I do not accept these elections because they do not meet the international democratic threshold. But so Shaka, I think we have to be serious here. Uh, let, let me push back again on that. Uh, uh, I mean, we always talk about uh, colonialism. Uh, the point you're trying to make is like as if we have to wait for these international observers to give credence to uh, our electoral system. Yet uh, we have African observers who in a way say, you know what, the elections, as far as they were concerned, the elections were free, fair and credible. So do we really have to take the international observers, the Europeans, the Americans, for their word? Far from it. Uh, that's not really my argument. By the way, during the last nearly 30 years of my being a journalist at the Voice of America, I have had opportunities to cover elections across the continent. And I know a credible election when I see it. I also know an election that lacks credibility when I see it. I am not talking about international observers. As a matter of fact, even in the international observers, you will find that uh, when they observe an election, they write very long reports, reports where they are very critical of elections they consider not meeting the international democratic threshold. But they don't put that into context. They do not fact that when five years later they are reinvited again to observe the same thing. They always end up, in fact, writing pretty much the same reports reflecting what they had actually said five years earlier. So I think everybody here should be serious. But the first people to be serious have to be the main stakeholders, the people on the ground themselves the Ugandan people. They are the ones that have the power. They are the ones that need the democracy, in fact, need social, economic, political justice. And they are the ones at the end of the day who are going to have to struggle. And once they struggle for it, there is a saying that victory is certain. How would you respond to uh, uh, critics who say that uh, uh, Bobby wine's uh, party uh the new uh he's a new kid on the block and uh his platform was more of an idea but then he lacked the what it takes really to be a leader because given yes he was able to rally young people around him but 
uh, a lot of critics have said that uh, he just had an idea and he didn't know how to execute that idea uh, of taking Museven out of power because he has overstayed his welcome. Uh, given what happened, uh, President Yoweri Museven still had an edge over Bobby Wine because he had something to show for it. He was not riding on the idea. I agree with some aspects of what you just said. But everything important comes from an idea. You have to have an idea first. And once you have it, then you test it. And later, you execute. You talk about uh, how, for example, Bebe Wine inspired the younger people. That is very significant. You know why? The last time I checked, I was looking at statistics. The vast majority of the population of Uganda, and indeed, the vast majority of the population of the entire African continent, guess what? It is young people. It is young people. And this time around in particular, when it came to Ugandan elections, or selections, as some would suggest, they actually came out in droves and actually went to vote. So it doesn't really matter how young or how old you are, because democracy basically provides the fact that uh, it is basically one person, one vote. So I don't think that is a problem. The problem that Bobby Wine and some of his colleagues, including the doing of Ugandan political opposition, Colonel Dr. Chiza Vesije, the problem some of those people have to deal with in the context of Uganda is the lack of the political playing field that is leveled. You are talking about, for example, some observers one time said, in fact suggested, that part of the problem when it comes to Uganda is because the incumbent president, Yoweri Museveni, these are their words, not mine, suffers from a disease of having a pathological fear of fair competition. And, it is, and since he is in charge of the country, he is in charge, for example, of the security forces, he is in charge of the police, of the military, of the intelligence. He also controls, by the way, the treasury. In other words, he controls the money. This is a man actually who is on record saying, my money, my army, my oil. So I am not even putting those words in his mouth. So when you find yourself operating an environment like that, it becomes very difficult sincerely for you to even get the benefit of democratic or competitive democracy, let alone a free, fair, transparent, verifiable, and credible election. We have uh, overwhelming uh, comments uh, here from uh, social media. It looks like uh, social media is back on, uh, or the internet is back on uh, in Uganda. We are getting a lot, a lot of uh, responses uh, from there that's part of lack of the political playing field that is level and so you have a situation where the incumbent government controls the traditional media and because the other type of media they cannot control is the social media they have to make sure that it does not work for the other party it is really one way of figuring out a way of dominating the media environment. In other words, you alone have unfettered access to the people where you can actually say a message. But your opponents do not have access to platforms which could allow them to actually sell their message to their people who they are trying to persuade 
vote for them. In fact, it does not stop there. You know that there are so many times when especially the major political opposition candidate, Bobby Wine, was arrested for apparently violating the coronavirus pandemic regulations that he was not supposed to campaign. And yet, it is true, you may have in fact had what they call uh, the lockdown, which was necessary. But I am reliably informed that that lockdown did not affect everybody equally. In fact, it is said that lockdown was selective lockdown, where the incumbent ruling party was pretty much free to do whatever it wanted, anywhere, anytime. Shaka, uh, I just remembered something that uh, uh, when I was reading, uh, doing research for this uh, uh, show, I came across uh, uh, a French uh, philosopher or a French poet, uh, Victor Hugo, uh, who once said that uh, it is an idea whose time has come. When you look at uh, how Bobby Wine outperformed even his critics, uh, today he's going to be the leader, his party is going to be the leader of opposition in parliament. He had more members of parliament. Uh, elected under his banner, uh, could this be the change that uh, a lot of people are looking for? Yes, he might not have won the presidency, but he won the hearts and minds of ordinary Ugandans. You may be right, uh, Ndugupol. Uh, he may in fact have not won the battle, but could he possibly in fact be on track to win the war, to win it all? It's quite possible because, after all, time is not his worst ally. Time, in fact, is his best ally. He is young, he is smart, articulate, charismatic, and uh, very likable. It also happens that um, he's running at a time, or operating at a time, when, in fact, his generation is the majority population of Uganda. And so you are clearly looking at someone that probably happens to be the leader of his generation. With that kind of advantage, in tandem with the social media, which, brought, which brings the world to that generation's fingertips, it gives them the opportunity empowers them to know what is happening within their neighborhood, within their surroundings, and beyond. And so you cannot stop them. You can stop an idea. An idea could probably detour. You can delay it and what have you. But at the end of the day, you cannot stop it. It will prevail. There's no question about that. Let's go to some uh, uh, comments here. Let's start uh, in uh, Zambia. Let's start with uh, Chinti Chanda. Uh, President Yori Museveni knows for sure that uh, he he would, even if he ran again uh, in the next election, he would win. Why? Because the opposition in Uganda has never had uh, the willingness uh, to unite together. You cannot fight uh, somebody who has been in power for so long without bringing your forces together. The gentleman from Zambia may in fact have a point. But uniting itself is not necessarily sufficient enough to remove or uproot somebody that has, is entrenched, that has been entrenched for the last generation. But definitely, it would be advisable for the opposition to come together and fight and speak with one voice. So you don't only need political parties or groups or the opposition to unite. You also need an environment, frankly, that is amenable to the idea of, at least for the first time, holding an election that is free, fair, transparent, verifiable, 
and credible. Let's go to Kwasi Ama in Ghana. It's obvious Sam Seven will always win. Why can't he declare himself as a monarch and we stop this business of crappy elections? I think he's right because, in fact, the way it is, he's pretty much as good as a presidential monarch. But actually, forget about this business of democracy because, after all, he has proven that he is not democratic. He might as well declare himself king of Uganda or emperor of Uganda. He would not have been the first individual to do so. In fact, there is a precedent in Ugandan politics. General Idi Amin Dada, my former commander-in-chief, a man who sometimes referred to himself as the commander, no, as the conqueror of the British Empire, declared himself the life president. He said the people of Uganda had decided that he, he had done such a great job, such a fantastic job, that he should become life president. And he became life president. But of course, he did not live very, very long to enjoy that position. Let's go to Kampala. Let's go to Akankwasa Jennifer. Uh, Shaka and Paul, you like to criticize uh, Museveni. Uh, we know where you stand. Uh, you are perhaps an uh, uh, opposition uh, uh, journalist uh, trying to discredit Museveni. But is it possible that uh, Museveni could have won this election uh, fair and square? Because when you think about it, almost everywhere in the rural areas, he won overwhelmingly. Uh, if he wanted to rig this election, Bobby Wine and his supporters could not have won any seat. When you look at the number of ministers who lost this election, uh, it's possible that actually people voted for Yoweri Museveni and voted against the ministers in Museveni's government. Thank you very much for that question, Jennifer. I don't know about Ndugu Paul Lio's uh, uh, status, but I can definitely speak for myself. I'm not affiliated to any political party, so I don't have any card uh, for that matter. In fact, <laughs> the last time I checked, uh, you and I, technically, we are not even Ugandans. We do not, in fact, have the right to participate in Ugandan politics. We do not vote. The last time I was in Kampala, which is five years ago, I arrived at the Entebbe International Airport. And I had to get a visa to enter a country where I was born. And so I don't think that uh, we make some remarks or critical remarks about President General Yoe Kaguta Museveni because we happen to be opposition political journalists. But if, in fact, we were, that should be within our rights. Because, in fact, the democracy suggests that uh, everybody has a right to own an opinion, however different that opinion may be to the government of the day. What you probably do not have, Jennifer, is having your own sets of facts. But as for an opinion, that one is as good as an inalienable right. And in fact, I also hope that you, at one point, probably think like that, because you deserve to have the right to own your opinion, Jennifer. As for whether he could win in the rural area or not, to be honest with you, I don't know. Because for me, what drives me in my coverage of that type of story are the facts. It is the data. It is not emotions. It has nothing to do with somebody being handsome or beautiful. It has nothing to do with somebody belonging to the same church that I, at that I attend if I do on Sundays. It is facts. And I offered myself when I came into this business to be a servant of nothing 
but the truth. So, my friend, Jennifer, it has nothing to do with what you probably just said. We are simply ordinary professional journalists trying to do our job and trying to make some contribution. Let's go to another comment uh, from Samuel Lubega in Kampala, Uganda. I'm a Muganda. I live in Kampala. And I want to say I congratulate President Yori Museveni. Uh, he's shown that he's still a leader to be reckoned with. And for that, uh, we overwhelmingly have voted for him. He has something to offer to Ugandans. Oh, yeah. Again, Mr. Rega is entitled to his opinion. But certainly not his sets of different sets of facts. I would rather Mr. Vega had told us why, in fact, they continue supporting the Ugandan president, General Yoweri Museveni Tiwaburwa. If he had told us what Yoweri Museveni adds, if he had told us the great contributions that he has made to the development of the Republic of Uganda, I would have been satisfied. Let's go to Sharon. She says, uh, what future does Bobby Wine hold for Uganda? Is there a future? Should we continue to look up to uh, the presidency of Bobby Wine as our leader? I think that um, Bobby Wine has offered himself. He has offered himself as a leader. And I think that uh, what you need to, to do is to give him the benefit of the doubt, is to enter into a conversation with Bobby Wine and other leaders in Uganda to find out specifically what is it that they actually have to offer. And you should be able to listen to not only Bobby Wine, listen to General Yoweri Museveni Tibuhaburwa, listen to General, listen to people like General Mujishamuntu, listen to people like Lieutenant General Henry Tumukunde, listen to other individuals that have offered themselves to be your leaders. Find out what is it that they have to offer. I am sure at the end of the day, when you compare and you contrast, you are very likely to get somebody that you feel comfortable with. In an example of football, if we have two teams and you have one person sincerely, who has the power to choose them free? the power to choose the linesmen, and even to choose spectators. Are you really in doubt as to who is going to win the game? And the players, too. And the players. <laughs> <laughs> it is the opposition members, sincerely, who have to figure it out. They should stop participating. They should stop running, but not really participating. In an event called an election, which is a selection, and after they go through the process and it is the incumbent who is announced as the winner, then they begin talking about how the election was neither free nor fair. They should have known that to begin with. And if they think that the environment does not allow the possibility of a credible election, then they should not participate. I think you make a very, very good uh, point. Uh, unfortunately, we've run out of time. We'll end it there. Thank okay. you so much. You're most welcome.